Well, the Lord be with you. Let's look now in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. Also, as you're turning there, Patsy made me think. I, I realized you, some of all you ladies got straws. The bulletin does not make for good spitballs. So <laughs> don't, don't, and if they're aiming them this way, you better have some volume to them as well. So. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. We'll be reading through verse 30. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I've told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, give us ears to hear, ears to hear your words as they transform us, as they convict us, as they encourage us. Lord, help us not only to hear them, but to take them into our hearts to do and become them, the people you're calling us to be. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's no secret these days some of the biggest movies out are superhero movies, comic book movies. And you can watch them, for the most part, without ever having picked up a comic book. I think, yeah, I can say I've watched all of them and don't know much about what goes on there. But I've been told that if you were really into them, if you're really into the comic books, man, the movies are so much better. They're like little subtle things, like some janitor named Jim sort of shows up in a comic book like eight times, and people go fanatically crazy when he's there on the screen. A friend of mine who's this way, actually I have several friends from seminary who are really big into comic books and things, have said, oh, Chris, you really got to get into it. Then you can read the comic books and go back and watch the movies, and oh, man, you, you just start, it just opens it wide open, and you see so much more of the story, and you can really know, really know what's going on. I think this can happen, too, when we read Scripture. That most of us can get the gist of the narrative. We, we've, we, we know the stories, right? Before Nikki even got up to read the 23rd Psalm this morning, you knew it, and then when she didn't read the King James Version, what'd you do? What? That's a little different. We can know the gist of a narrative. Maybe we've read it more than once before. But there are those details, those small things that might actually contribute a great deal to understanding what's really going on in the text. Sometimes these details are subtle, more like literary winks written into the text as a sort of nod to the original audience of it. These sort of details may seem really unimportant to us, strange, odd, we just pass them by. Yet they would have jumped right off the page to those who first read and heard the words of Scripture. There are times when those sorts of details may not affect our understanding of the text a great deal. Time when these details may only serve to sort of reinforce what we already know and believe the text to be communicating to us. But then there are those times when those small bits can add a facet of understanding to the text that causes us to go back and read it again. And to listen again with new and different ears. I believe there are a few of those sorts of bits that speak to us in this text before us this morning. The Good Shepherd passage from John's Gospel. So let's listen to some of them again with new and different ears. Right away in the text we're told, at, the time, at that time the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Now that seems like harmless exposition. 
some scene setting just to get the date and time right, sort of like, well, at the beginning of one of those superhero movies for just a flash up, Hong Kong, 2012, right? But it's more than that. After all, how many of you know what the Festival of Dedication is? We call it something different these days. We call it Hanukkah. But there it was. It's the Festival of Dedication. Uh, they're in the portico of Solomon, located in Herod's, the second temple. And we're told it's winter, so it's cold. Gives us a little context. But Hanukkah, the festival of dedication, was, was there. It was a festival, and still is, that celebrates the victory of one Judas Maccabeus over the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanius, the one who had set up the, the desolating sacrilege in the temple. He had put a statue of the god of Zeus in the most holy place. The abomination that desolates, I believe is what Daniel calls it. Judas the hammer, which by the way, wouldn't you love to have that name? Judas, of all the bad Bible names, Judas got the best, and then he's not even in our Protestant canon. Judas Maccabeus and the Maccabees, they overthrew Antiochus IV cleansed the temple, rededicated the altar for worship of the God of Israel. And so, this festival of this rededication of the temple took place. Now, unlike other festivals in the Jewish calendar in Jesus' day, this one didn't have to be celebrated at the temple. It could be observed at home. This is why it is so popular in the West among our Jewish friends to have Hanukkah around the time that we have Christmas. It was observed with the lighting of candles. A celebration recalling the victory of one of Israel's own over the Gentile oppressors. A festival that celebrated the power and might of one so-called Messiah who had proven triumphant over the heathen Gentiles and their desolating sacrilege. And while it may not have been one of the most major festivals of the day, the festival of dedication surely would have taken place and people definitely would have talking, been talking at this time about the Messiah about the Gentiles, about the Roman oppressors, and the need. Yeah, you know what we need? We need another Judas the Hammer. Someone who's going to rise up and get rid of Rome. That's what we need. That would have been the conversation as they lit the candles on the menorah. The need for the temple to be cleansed again. Now, I don't doubt that with such talk, such imagery in the hearts and minds of the people, there may have been some questions, some murmuring about this Jesus of Nazareth. Possibly, possibly gathering up a move in, movement to be like Judas the Hammer before him. To overtake the Romans. To reinstate some sort of Jewish government over the city of Jerusalem. If not all over Judea. And I suppose that's why we were told, John says, the Jews gathered around him, said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Messiah? Tell us plainly. Maybe they had just lit one of the candles on the menorah to come to Jesus and say, you know, we've been talking at home. Are you the Messiah? We've been celebrating Judas and, and the victory over the Gentiles. Are you the one who's going to give it to us again? But here again, though, there's a bit of context we're lacking. You see, at first reading, the Jews, what the fourth gospel terms these Jewish leaders in opposition to the Jesus movement, they seem anxious almost wanting Jesus to surprise them, to claim to be the Messiah. How long will you keep us in suspense, the NRSV says. It sounds like they're on the edge of their seats, on the verge of either believing Jesus and following Him, or just throwing out His whole ideology and looking for the next so-called Messiah. But here's the thing, though. What those people are literally saying, the way you literally translate it, how long are you going to keep taking away our life? Now that sounds a little different, doesn't it, than how long will you keep us in suspense? Even still, it's still not right to translate it literally. It's more of an idiom. More of an idiom among the Jewish folks who spoke Greek in those days. How long are you going to take away our life is more understood as how long are you going to keep on irritating us? How long will you keep bothering us? Just spit it out. 
So the question in verse 24 is perhaps better understood as something like, how long will you keep annoying us? How long will you keep bothering us? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly, stop speaking in riddles and avoiding our questions. That's a better way, I think, to translate it. These Jewish leaders are annoyed. They're irritated with Jesus. He refuses to answer their questions directly. Refuses to fess up to whether or not He's the Messiah. And perhaps Jesus just likes messing with them. Likes to keep them on their toes. But judging by His response in verses 25 through 30, Jesus, well, He's already answered their questions. I've told you, He says. You just don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you don't believe. Because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. No one will take them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I, Jesus says, are one. I've already told you. That's what He says. But like that cold winter air just outside the protective walls of Solomon's portico, their understanding of Jesus is cold, it's frigid, it's, it's unmovable because they've brought their own expectations with their questions. Expectations of those who already have it figured out. Those who already believe they know what and who the Messiah is supposed to be. Jesus has already told them the answer to their question, but they can't hear because they have the ears of those who've already decided who and what God's anointed one is supposed to do, what the Messiah is supposed to be. They're like those folks who, when they ask you for your opinion, they're not so much looking for your opinion, but to see whether or not you agree with theirs. The Jews, as John calls them, had the image of one like Judas Maccabeus, one with a name like the Hammer, who would rise up as a powerful political hero, who would storm the palaces of the Romans, waving the flag of his people in one hand, wielding a terrible swift sword in the other. And perhaps they had in mind a Messiah who would make it worthwhile to be a part of the Jewish elite, part of the upper crust of the Israelite establishment. One who would fully reinstate the temple cult and its practices that favored those who can make the journey to Jerusalem. Those who could afford the sacrifices. For these Jewish leaders, Jesus' words spoke less as a Messiah and more like a social worker. One who spent time with the poor the needy, the sick, the outcast. I mean, sure, he had performed some signs of power and wonder, miracles like feeding thousands of people, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, even raising the dead. But had any of those actions actually driven out a single Roman? He even raised a Roman's daughter from the dead. Had Jesus' actions actually benefited the Jewish nation as a whole? What about the temple? What about, what about this pride and desire to be governed once again by God's people? Jesus hadn't done anything to bring anything like that about. In fact, it seems upon further inspection of the narrative that the crowds that were following Jesus, well, they weren't all just the Jews, as John calls them. They were filled with all types of folks. Who were the last ones? The last ones you want to start this kind of revolution? Fishermen? As we said last week, they're not even the good ones. Tax collectors? Show me somebody who likes a tax collector. Anybody. Besides a tax collector's mama. And even she probably don't like him that much. <laughs> Lepers? Lepers aren't supposed to leave there. No, no, no. Here's the boundary. You lepers stay there. You might infect the rest of us. They were the anti-vaxxers of their day, I suppose. You stay over there, you might bring that leprosy to us. The formerly demon-possessed? You don't, you know I, I know, I know she used to have a demon. And now I know she says she got religion and she's clean and all, but I just, keep, I don't want her in the crowd, you know. You got women. Mother's Day is a bad day to point out how women weren't really respected in the old, in, the old world, I guess. And children. 
My goodness. You really don't want to go anywhere with children. You don't want to start a revolution with children. I don't want to go to a Fina's with children. In fact, we don't. We broke a plate last time. We ain't been back. But you don't want to start a revolution. What are you going to do? Give them a knife and say, stand still, honey, and if one of them with a little broom on their head comes, just start swinging? No. Gentiles. Hey, this isn't your, you're supposed to be on the other side of the fight anyway. Samaritans, well, you know how they felt about them. This isn't your fight. You aren't our people. Prostitutes. I mean, do you really want to be seen with a pro? No. The homeless. Lord, what do they have to offer? They ain't even got a place to sleep. They don't even have, they don't even have, all they got is a little cardboard sign walking around asking for, you don't want them as a part of the revel, addicts, man, you don't want them, what if they, what if they throw the whole thing off? Roman soldiers, they're the ones we're fighting. Don't forget the poor. What in the world do the poor have to offer a revolution like this? Yeah, I mean, you read the story. They want Jesus to be Judas and Maccabeus, and you look out, and boy, this is a ragtag bunch of folks. Bill Murray and Stripes had a better group of folks than these people do. And if you don't get that joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> no wonder these Jewish leaders are annoyed with Jesus. What are you doing? These folks aren't a part of this. There's all the hype, all this talk about Jesus being the Messiah and he can't even put together a decent following. They're frustrated, annoyed, because Jesus won't answer them directly. You know, Jesus, if you just answered us directly, all the good folks would get on your side and we'd go. We'd go right now to the temple. But the truth is, Jesus has answered them loud and clear. They just don't like the response they got from him. So they refuse to take it seriously, to listen to it with ears tuned for the voice of the Good Shepherd. And aren't we like that sometimes? Don't we have our expectations of what Jesus should do, of who Jesus should be? Don't we bring our own certainties to the table when it comes to defining who Jesus is? We've read the scriptures. We say we've read the prophecies, we've listened to the preachers tell us about the sweet by and by and the Christ who promised us health, wealth, and prosperity. We've got our own expectations of a Jesus who, who, who likes the things we like, who doesn't like the things we don't like, a, a Christ who sees things our way, who speaks our language, who meets our needs. But isn't it just a bit annoying when Jesus doesn't meet those expectations? Doesn't it let you down just a little bit when you've prayed and prayed and prayed and you don't get what you want? Isn't it frustrating when Jesus proves to be more than the image we've carved out for him? More than the box we've tried to keep him in? When we listen to the words of Jesus of the Good Shepherd found in Scripture, when we listen for the words of Jesus from the Holy Spirit, when we listen to His words with our own ears, ears tuned for happy platitudes, self-serving arguments and proof texts, I'm afraid, more often than not, we wind up just like these Jews in John's Gospel. At best, we're in suspense, mostly wanting to hear what's next, hoping the next word is the right word. But mostly, mostly sometimes we get frustrated and annoyed because Jesus isn't fitting in our plans, our picture of what a Savior is supposed to be. However, when we listen with the ears of sheep, listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd, we cannot help but hear the very heart of God. When we listen with ears tuned for the kingdom of God, a kingdom made up of all the wrong kinds of folks it takes to make a movement, all the wrong kinds of people it takes to start a revolution. All the wrong kinds of people, period. When we listen with ears tuned to that kingdom, when we listen with those kinds of ears, we are sure to hear the good news that has made a way where there once was no way. 
And that's not to say there won't be times along the way when we won't get annoyed, when we won't be irritated or frustrated by each other, by the words of Christ, by the truth of the gospel. After all, Jesus' words are actually for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. And let's face it, I don't like everybody. I don't know if you like everybody. We may not want other sheep following our shepherd, listening to his voice, getting in on all that grace going around, but the truth is there is a wideness to the love and grace of Christ that is beyond our expectations. That is beyond even our comprehension. That's why we can listen in the first place. That's why I'm allowed to listen in the first place. That's why we know the Savior's voice. Because in spite of our own stubbornness, like sheep, in spite of our own expectations and desires of a custom-made Christ, God still gives us grace. The voice of Christ still calls us with words of love. The shepherd's voice is not one of which to be afraid. It is a voice of love, a call of love. And so may we listen to his call not with ears searching for what we hope to hear, what we want to hear, but with ears of sheep who belong to the Good Shepherd. May we listen to the Savior's voice and follow Him. For He's calling now. Maybe He's calling you to just come join the flock anyway. To say out loud what you've said to yourself so quietly for so long, I want to follow Jesus. Now's the time to say it out loud, to profess it to the church. Maybe you've been quietly doing that and said, you know, that baptism thing, I've been wanting to do that for a while. Now's the time. Listen to the voice of the shepherd calling you into the waters. Whatever it is, the Spirit's calling you to now. Listen for the voice of the shepherd. Even if you don't like the words and the things you hear, listen for the voice of the shepherd. He's calling you to come and follow him wherever and with whomever he may call you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, and the Good Shepherd. Lord, we are your sheep. And we come now, Lord, to listen to your voice. So call us. Help us, Lord, to hear you calling. Not whatever it may be that we hope to hear, but God, what you have for us. For as your sheep, Lord, we know that whatever it is you call us to, whoever it is you call us with, Lord, it is not for our detriment, but for the goodness of your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, speak. Move among us now. Help us, Lord, to make whatever moves, whatever decisions, whatever it is on our hearts you have for us this morning. Help us to take hold and give us the courage to act. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.